Good morning, Hope Community Baptist Church. It's great to be with you this morning, worshiping God with all of you. Um, will you join us as we start this morning in worship, um, praising God's name? I cast my And you all can have a seat. All right, good morning, Hope, uh, and happy Sunday. This is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Psalm 104 and 5, this is what it says. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So that's what we're here for today is to praise and worship the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. We're delighted you joined us this morning. We're delighted if you're joining us online. 
And if you're a guest, what we encourage you to do is there's a little uh, rip-off uh, card in the bulletin that you could uh, fill out so we could get to know you a little bit better. Uh, in terms of the announcements this morning, there's uh, a lot of them in the bulletin. I'll let you read those uh, yourself. I'm a little long-winded. I could probably double the size of those announcements by uh, reading them, but uh, I think a couple of things to take uh, into account here is that the Mackinac Island trip for the seniors, you gotta get that money in by August 28th to Marlene Hemmerling, so I believe that's in two weeks. So you gotta start saving now, since that uh, trip is uh, costing a little bit of money. And then the school supply drive is still going on, so you'll be able to uh, contribute through the month of August. That's to help uh, with some kids in local uh, schools around our church here. So I encourage you to do that. Uh, in terms of uh, another announcement that uh, just c came to me was that Jan Copas uh, is back in the hospital. So we should definitely uh, keep her in our uh, prayers. So with that, I'm going to call on Tom Newman to come up and share some uh, good news. So if you've had a family every once in a while, you'd have a family meeting about rules and regulations of uh, what to do in the house and how to, how to handle certain things. And as trustee chairman, I just thought I'd share some news pertaining to the facility uh, and some things that we just want to communicate to the membership. Number one, you heard all about the big water main break. There was boil water advisories. The city of Sterling Heights has essentially said that we don't need to boil the water, the water's safe in Sterling Heights, so feel free to use the drinking fountains and all that good stuff. Uh, you might have noticed coming to church today, orange cones on the side of Hayes Road. We got a nice letter from the city of Sterling Heights. They're gonna begin construction this Monday. Uh, they'll probably be taking it down to one lane each way. The driveway that accesses our building will be narrowed or they'll have temporary driveways. And so two things, I'd ask you, uh, you're probably going to realize there's going to be horrible traffic. It was bad this week if you come here during the week. So you might want to uh, take a little extra time to plan on coming to church. And also as you're pulling into the church parking lots, be careful because the driveway might not be as wide as it once was as they're doing the temporary construction. Um, men, this is for you. Apparently we have a problem leaving clothing articles behind in the church. Uh, there's about 10 or 12 coats and a couple men's uh, hats. I've got them all in the coat rack as you're going toward the church office, just right next to the uh, uh, water uh, fountain. I'd ask you to go there, check, and see if one of those coats belongs to you or the hat. Feel free to take them. In two weeks, if they're still there, I'm going to take them to the Salvation Army. Um, the other thing, a lot of people come up to me and say, Tom, can I have a key to the church? So here's the thing. We're not making any more keys to the church. Um, and the biggest thing is, is we need to get keys that people have that aren't using them, return them to me so I can uh, send them out to other people that need it. I have a list of all the, where the keys are supposed to be. I don't think it's up to date because I think four or five of the keys are issued to people that have passed on. So if you have a key uh, and you don't know what it is, and if you flip it over on the back and it says do not reproduce, that's a good chance that that's a church key. So if you don't need the church key, please get them back to me. Um, the other thing I want to let you know about is um, uh, Greg Reidenauer was our facilities manager and he retired on July 31st. And so we've kind of divided the roles and responsibilities as follows. We have a couple called Helen, and Carmen Marion. Uh, they take care of cleaning the bathrooms, uh, restocking paper products, vacuuming, and they do that twice a week. But as far as maintaining the church facility, we really have the whole board of trustees working on kind of a volunteer basis. And we're, we've got a list of things to do list, and we're kind of knocking them out. So if there's something in the building that you think needs attention, please let one of the trustees know. We'll add it to the list, and we'll start working on it. Um, the other thing that's been a little bit uh, uh, bothersome to us is a lot of times we come across spills on the carpeting. Uh, we want you to enjoy your beverages and things like that, but just like at home, if you spill something on the carpet, I don't think you just leave it and walk on. Uh, what I would ask you to do is use some paper towel, try to dab it dry, uh, flush it with some water, dab it some more. Uh, nothing's worse than coming across a stain that's been there for two or three weeks that's dried up. It makes it a lot harder to get it out of the carpeting. So we just ask that if you spill something, take the effort to clean it up. 
And then the last thing I wanted to share with you is just give you an update on the lobby and uh, foyer renovation. As you can see, we've been making good progress. I'd say the library is pretty much done. And Lily has said that I think the library will be open for business in one to two weeks. So stick your head in there if you want to see. Uh, foyer and, uh, uh, and the cafe are pretty much done. You got to mount some more hardware on the floor, uh, on the walls, and on the doors. And then we also got to get some new furniture. Our goal is to have it all done uh, before the big restart, which is September 11th. And we just uh, thank you for your patience. We know that we've had barriers up and a little dirt and dust. We appreciate your patience for all that. So that's it for the housekeeping items. Uh, if you have any questions about the facility, feel free to reach out and talk to me. At this time, I'd like to invite Jared to come on up. I think he has something special for us. Well, good morning. So for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Jared Gosling. I'm a student here at Hope. And uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, I taught a little lesson at a Backyard Bible study, and I just wanted to share a little bit of that with you. Um, so as we've been going through uh, the significant women in the Bible this summer, there was one that caught my eye, um, and her name is Hagar. So if you're not familiar with the story of Hagar, um, she was a slave. Uh, Sarah and Abraham's slave in Genesis. So what happened in that story, I'm only going to give you the last half, but I'll give you a little bit of the front, uh, front of the story. And what happened there was Sarah and Abraham were promised a son. Now at this point, they're in their 80s or 90s, and they're looking at it like, God, there's no way that we're having a child at this point, right? So they think that they're smarter than God. They're not. And they decide we're gonna try to get some help to have this child. So what they do is they use their slave and Abraham goes and sleeps with his slave so, uh, uh, so that they can have a child because at that time, the child that would be conceived by the slave would become Sarah's child. Now the problem was that once this happened and once the child was born, this slave Hagar believed that she was better than Sarah and she had a pride problem. And because of this, she despised Sarah, and Sarah mistreated her because of this. Now, I'm gonna pick up when she ran away from Sarah, and this is what uh, Genesis 16, seven through 15 says. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Beer the High Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore, son, bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael. So you might be looking at me and saying, all right, Jared, well, what does that mean and what's the point? Well. Uh, this is a commentary that I read. These are not my words, but this is something that really stuck out to me that I felt like I should share. And it says, this is the first appearance of the angel of the Lord in the Bible. He didn't appear first to Noah or Enoch or Abram. The angel of the Lord first appeared to a single mother-to-be who had a pride problem and was mistreated by the woman who put her into the whole mess. So if you're asking for a point from this, the point is that one, it doesn't matter who you are. God's going to use you if you let him. And the other point from this is that she didn't say, well, God, what am I, do I really have to name him Ishmael? Are you sure? Do I really have to go back to Sarah? No, she didn't ask questions. She just went. And that's what we need to do. When God calls us, we go. So if you'd please stand with me, I'd like to pray us out. Um, so Lord, thank you so much for your love for the unlikely. And thank you so much for using us no matter where we go, no matter how far gone we are, you don't stop pursuing us, and thank you for that. Thank you for your love for us, 
and thank you so much for the fact that we're still usable to you no matter what. So Lord, I pray that we would, we would follow you and that when you call us, we would go. I pray for all these things and I put it in your name, amen. Is one. 
be seated. Well, good morning. How are you doing out there today? Great. <laughs> Sounds like one person's doing good. You all right out there tonight? Today? I almost said tonight. Where am I? It is good to see you. Good to be here with you. Sorry about last week. We had a bit of a false alarm last week, um, but Ashley, my wife, she is doing well, about 37 weeks along. She's a little bit tired, which I'm still getting used to, but she is doing well, so I appreciate your, your prayers in that, and uh, we, we look forward to the, the coming child, um, our coming son, and so we're excited about that, but it's good to be here with you this morning to bring you God's Word again. Next week, we have a guest speaker coming uh, to bring you the Word and also the following week, which I am also looking forward to. We also want to encourage you to keep bringing in those essays uh, for uh, this painting here, this picture that is over here to my left and your right. We have already had uh, many in the past couple weeks coming in online. Uh, we're going to read a few of them next week for you, but obviously there is a prize being given away uh, for that, and uh, so you'll want to get those in by September 1st, uh, and we're going to consider 
which essay will be awarded that top prize. So you'll want to get that in as soon as possible. Well, thank you, Jared, for sharing that devotional today. It's always great seeing Abide students getting up here up front here and sharing a devotional. I hope you guys all appreciated that. Did you? Did you? Yeah, I thought that was good stuff. It was great seeing Mike filling in the other week when we needed him to, getting up here and preaching. It's always good to have our elders up here preaching. And you even got a round of applause afterwards. I, I, don't, I don't think I've gotten that yet. So... A lot, of per, a lot of kudos to you there, Mike. Great, great. What's that? They were glad it was over, yeah. I don't know. Very humble. Well, this morning, I want to ask you a question as we get started. Have you ever been caught? Have you ever been caught doing something? Maybe right in the very act, red-handed. Have you ever been there? where you've been caught, where you can't even lie to get yourself out of it. Hand in the cookie jar, crumbs in your mouth, right, kind of caught. I know I have. It was when I was 17 years old. I was with my buddies. We were leaving school, and I had about three of us in my 1997 Monte Carlo. Some of you don't even know what kind of car that is. Chevy Monte Carlo, burgundy color. I was feeling good, driving home. It was a beautiful spring afternoon, and we're on the highway. And I remember as I was driving home with my buddies, we we started to dip down into a a little valley uh, as the highway kind of takes you. And uh, before you know it, I've lost track of my speed. And as I'm driving, I'm almost to the exit. I see these blue and red lights coming up from behind me and they're coming up fast and I look down at my speedometer and I see I'm going 85 miles an hour yeah I'm not too proud of that right and I know this guy he's coming after me I've been caught right and so he pulls me over I come over to the side of the road and obviously he gets out of his car and he he comes up and he he tells me what I did wrong and I already know what I've done wrong and he's asking for my license and registration and as he's asking me for my license and registration I actually notice another car go by me and I notice that that car looks oddly familiar it looks almost like it's my dad's car and then I see this car pull over to the side of the road and start to back itself up towards my car And that's when it dawned on me, I had really now been caught, right? And if you don't know, my dad was a police officer as well, so that also added to the situation. I'll never forget the look my dad had on his face as he got out of his car and pierced right through mine to my eyes. It was a look that I'll never forget. I had been caught. I had been caught. On the other hand, it kind of worked out for me because I actually got out of the ticket, if I can say that full disclosure, right? But, but it still didn't end all that well with what my dad had to lecture about afterwards, but I had been caught. I thought I'd been caught when it came to the police officer, when it came to the law, but I was really found out when I realized my dad had actually seen what had gone on. And today in our story and where we're going, I think you're going to see the same sort of thing happening. There was a woman who was caught. But what I'm going to argue today is that there was another group of people that I believe were really found out, that they were the ones who were actually caught when it comes to what has taken place. If you would, I'd love for you to go to John chapter 8. That's where we're going to be today in the Word of God. We've been going through this series, Outstanding Women in the Bible, and we've been looking at different characters within the scriptures, some Old Testament, some New Testament. Last week, we looked at the Canaanite woman, and we saw how real faith, it persists, right? That's what authentic faith does. Through all odds, it continues to persist. And today, we're going to be looking at the woman who's been caught in an act. She's been caught in doing something that she could not lie herself, lie her way out of. We are looking at the woman in John chapter 8. And before we really dive into John chapter 8, 
we really have to see what's going on up to this point because it really does have a lot to do with this story. You see, in John chapter 7, Jesus has been teaching. He's been teaching in the temple in Jerusalem, and he's been teaching during one of the Jewish festivals. It's the Festival of Tabernacle. And as he has been teaching, there was a division that was uh, basically arising within the crowd about who Jesus really was. Because some thought he was a lunatic. They even thought he was demon-possessed. And others thought, no, I think he's a good man. I think there's something to this guy. But they still wondered how this man from Galilee could really be the Messiah. I mean, John even tells us that even his own brothers were doubting Jesus and who this, guy's, who this guy was. But then you come to the religious leaders, and they have a completely different opinion of who Jesus was. See, they think Jesus is a loose cannon, someone who needs to be dealt with. They are privately now trying to figure out how they are going to destroy this man. And at one point, they even send out temple guards to go and arrest Jesus, and the temple guards come back empty-handed. And when they are questioned, why are you coming back with, with no Jesus here, they basically just say, no one has ever spoken with such authority as this man. And so that's where we come to this point in John chapter 8. And I can imagine these religious leaders are now stewing about how they can get their hands on Jesus. And so let's go. Let's look into the scripture here in John chapter 8. I'm going to start in verse 2. It says this. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. That's referring to Jesus. All the people came to him. And he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? So we can see here from the outset what's kind of going on here. Jesus has gone again to teach around the temple. It's early in the morning. Dawn is breaking, which I think has some symbolic meaning there with who Jesus is in this chapter. If you look at the theme of the chapter, I would encourage you to read the whole chapter if you can. It's an amazing chapter. I love John chapter 8. But we know that Jesus is now teaching. There's a crowd of people, and out of nowhere, all of a sudden, we see the scribes and the Pharisees come before Jesus and throw somebody in the midst of this crowd. And it happens to be a woman who they say was caught in the act. And they throw her before Jesus and they say to Jesus, the law states that this woman, Moses said that this woman, such women should be put to death, should be stoned for such an act as she was found out to be. Now, these Pharisees and leaders, they're they're not bringing some imaginary law. This isn't some made-up thing or some addition to the law that they're bringing before Jesus. This is actually from Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, which says, If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. So what the Pharisees and scribes are pulling out here is not something, like I said, that is imaginary, something that was added. This is actually something that uh, from the surface, from from just a a, a shallow kind of view, uh, seems to have some credence to what is actually going on. But what you really have to do with this story is you really have to put on a detective hat. You really have to look at this thing and analyze what are the Pharisees, what are the scribes up to here. And I believe when you do that, you'll actually find some interesting things that are going on. Because in order for evidence for them to do this, they would have to have two or three witnesses, this is what the law required, that would give a strong testimony who would see these two in that kind of 
context. They would have to be lying in the same bed, they would have to have unmistakable body movements, and they would have to have positive identities. The two witnesses had to see these things at the same time and place so that their testimonies would be identical. Such evidence, I believe, would, be virtually, would virtually require the witnesses to do something that is a little bit manipulative. And I believe we get a key to this story that is found in verse number six, which John gives us the motive as to why these Pharisees and scribes are doing this. And we find that, like I said, in verse six, when it says, this they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. So we see the motive here at play with these Pharisees. Now, I believe there are three holes in what the Pharisees and the scribes are doing here. One, first of all, the law also expected that if a pertinent person witnessed another about to commit a sin, compassion required them to speak up. These witnesses, they stood silently by, neglecting their moral obligation to give guidance to the woman. They wanted to catch her and use her. Any um, fishing fans out there? Anybody love to fish? Well, there's a few of you out there, right? Anybody can't stand fishing? It's like watching paint dry. Wow, that was a quick hand there. Yeah, I see you there, right? Yeah, I'm kind of still on the fence about fishing. I, I'm still trying to figure out if it's something that's uh, really all that enjoyable. I mean, spending three, four hours out on the lake just sitting there, it, uh, well, it can sound a bit laborious. But there are some who don't like fishing because of what you have to do, especially with the worm, right? There are some of you who actually feel empathy for that worm and what it feels when it's placed on the hook thrown into the water to bring something bigger in right now that's that's great empathy but let's be honest that's not the kind of empathy that these religious leaders had towards this woman these religious leaders made this adulterous woman their bait they cared nothing for her as a person. She was simply a means to an end to snare Jesus. That's all that mattered to them. And that's why we must ask the question, is it possible to be legally right even from a biblical perspective and yet have a wrong heart? And I find in the church today, we sometimes fall into this category. We sometimes fall into this trap ourselves. And I think what you're going to see in this story today is you're either going to land in the voice of the critics or you're going to land in the voice of Christ. You see, this adulterous woman, as I just said, was used for selfish reasons. These critics used her for their own personal agenda. And I, I just have to say this this morning. Can I just tell you that just because you blow out somebody else's candle, it doesn't make your candle shine any brighter. You can't build yourself up by tearing somebody else down. I believe jealousy will destroy your chance at success before you even have a chance to get started. If you see someone else doing well, celebrate them. Jump on board. These Pharisees, what they wanted to do was blow out the candle of Jesus in an effort to make themselves look better or more spiritual. You know, it disturbs me when I hear Christians badmouth other Christians. It disturbs me when I hear Christians badmouth other preachers, or even worse, when I hear preachers badmouth other preachers. I don't believe it adds any voltage to your spiritual battery. As a matter of fact, I actually think it drains it. We're all faced with situations where different voices, I believe, compete for our attention. We fail to recognize the world or the crowd from which we so often seek approval and affirmation that we, they, they just really don't care about us. We are just tools to be used and discarded as needed to advance someone else's personal agenda. 
And like the Pharisees, we sometimes are guilty of pointing out the failures of others while ignoring our own in order to advance up an invisible spiritual ladder of status. We have to be careful of it or else we can find ourselves in the same shoes as these scribes and Pharisees were in this particular matter. But secondly, what we find from what the Pharisees and scribes are doing and one of the holes that we find in their, their little plot here is that we must ask if the woman is married or betrothed to another man. A woman who is sexually unfaithful to her fiancé was to be put to death along with her lover. So we have to ask the question, where is the man in this situation, right? And as a matter of fact, we find a little bit of their motive too when it says in verse 5, now the law in Moses commanded us to stone such women. You see, this is a subtle misinterpretation or understanding of what was actually going on and what the scripture actually said for these Pharisees and scribes. Well, it seems as though they have forgotten one important piece to the puzzle. And what I would say, and I know this has a little bit of reading into when it comes to this text, is that maybe even one of the men was involved in contriving and luring this woman in. But we won't know that for sure. But the third thing we see is that these witnesses, they bring the woman to Jesus before a crowd and heap public shame on her. They have kept her to one side and brought her case. What they should have done is brought her case privately to Jesus. Instead, they've decided to do it in a public matter in order to heap this kind of shame towards her. And so we see kind of some of the holes that these Pharisees and scribes have in their plot towards Jesus. So how is Jesus going to respond? And I think... What you'll find is an ingenious way of responding. Because what the Pharisees have done here is obviously they've presented Jesus with two different scenarios. It's either option A or it's option B. And neither one of them are really any good options, right? They have tried to place Jesus between a rock and a hard place. Option A is you obviously agree with them and now you're undermining your own ministry. And not only that, but you're going against Roman government because they were the ones who sentenced these kinds of things. So there's option A or there's option B and you go against the law of Moses and contradict what the word of God is saying. And so Jesus is here placed in a very tough situation. How would he respond? And we find that in verse 6 after we're told the note about why these Pharisees and scribes are bringing this woman over to Jesus, it says, Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as he's writing on the ground, it tells us they continued to ask him. They continued to badger him. They continued to say, stop stalling here, Jesus. What is it that you got to say? But Jesus just stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Now, what did Jesus write in the ground? Well, it's a good question. Nobody knows really for sure what Jesus wrote on the ground, but we do get a little, I think, clue into what he may have wrote on the ground as he goes on to say, as he steps up, stands up, and says to the Pharisees, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her, and once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. So what did Jesus write here? Well, one opinion is that Jesus was angry. He was very frustrated with what was going on here. And so he needed to calm his nerves a little bit here. He needed to just calm himself down as he's seen what's going on and what's taking place before him. I don't know if that's quite the case, but some have suggested this may be it. Number two, maybe Jesus was just collecting his thoughts. This has just been presented to him, and, and so he's, he's just stalling a little bit with a tactic in order to kind of collect his thoughts and figure out how he wants to really answer 
these leaders. But then there's number three, and I, and I would probably, I would probably subscribe to this one here. You see, and I think a big clue that's given to us is not only in what Jesus says, but it's in the Greek word to write. The Greek word to write is typically a word, it's grapho. But in this case, there's actually a word added to it, it's kata. So the whole Greek word is kata grapho. The word kata means against. So Jesus is writing against these Pharisees. Or another way to say it is Jesus is giving a counter accusation against these leaders and these scribes. So it is possible that Jesus could be writing in the ground their own sins, hypocrisy, greed, pride, hatred. Or maybe he wrote even something specific to these leaders in this particular situation. It's possible he wrote even Exodus chapter 23, verse 1. I'm sure he didn't write the whole verse out, but maybe just the reference that says, do not help a wicked man by being a malicious witness. We don't know for sure what Jesus wrote in the ground, but it does seem that he was writing something of an accusation that was pointing to their malicious intent and what they were doing, maybe even pointing at the fact that they themselves had contrived and schemed up this whole plan in order to trap Jesus. I think another amazing thing we see here is that Jesus wrote twice in the ground. I think that refers back to God who it had written twice the Ten Commandments off Mount Sinai. Now here Jesus is writing twice symbolically fulfilling the same kind of role even though now it seems he's writing a different kind of law, a new law, that of the law of grace. And so he says to these men, let him who is without sin be the first to cast a stone. Now, as we see this and what Jesus says, I don't think what Jesus is saying here is let him who is morally without sin who is morally perfect, you can throw the first stone. Or else none of us would be able to hold anybody accountable because we've all fallen short. We've all sinned, right? We've all, we've all had our, our issues. I don't think that's exactly what Jesus is trying to get at here. If you look at what Jesus is saying and, the, and, and, and how he is writing in the ground, it seems as though what Jesus is really saying here is whoever among you is without equal guilt in this specific case should be the one to initiate the execution. It's almost like Jesus is saying, okay, you choose whether you also want to die because of this crime of adultery, which you intentionally set up. Now, I know that has, you're reading into it a little bit here, and I know this takes a little bit of speculative work, but I think if we do our due diligence in what Jesus is saying here, we can kind of see what's going on. You see, these Pharisees and scribes, their hatred, their jealousy had started to stir and boil up so much within them that it seems as though they have come to the point where they are willing to contrive a plan that would set up this woman, maybe even one of the men are involved in it, in order to lure her into their trap so that they could have this scenario that could undermine Jesus and take him down. And Jesus sees right through it. And while they're trying to show this woman as the one who's caught in the act, it's actually them that are found out and caught in their act. And it's amazing to see how Jesus brings a third hidden option to the table here. And the wisdom and the grace is just amazing. And these men walk away one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, probably because their conscience weighed on them a little bit more. As you know, as you get older in life, right, your conscience weighs on you a little bit more, or at least that's how it's supposed to be. When they heard it, they went away one by one until only the woman was left alone with Jesus. And we're told as the woman was standing before him, Jesus stood up, said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, 
sin no more. Wow, that's grace. That is Jesus there on display showing this woman and giving this woman something she did not deserve. Have you ever wondered if maybe God is a little too gracious? Have you ever asked that question or that person, you know, they're just too nice, right? They're just, I don't know, they're, they're, they're too generous. It's like no matter what you do, they're always just showing grace. And maybe, maybe we shouldn't give that much grace because maybe, you know, they might take advantage of it or abuse it. And I got to tell you, there's two basic uh, counters to this kind of thinking, right? You have two boxes, and it seems as though we always try to place things in two labels, right? You have box A, and you have box B. You have conservatives, you have liberals. You have Republicans, you have Democrats, right? You, you're either a Michigan fan or a Michigan State fan. You either drive a Dodge truck or a Ford truck. I think we all know the right answer is a Dodge truck, right? That's no offense to all you Ford guys out there, right? But that, you know, we, we are just always trying to place people in boxes. And we do this in theology too, especially when it comes to God's grace. We have what is called antinomianism, which is no law without law, which basically says you can do whatever you want, however you want, whenever you want. God is going to bless you. He's going to fix it. You do don't worry about it. You can do whatever you want. God is your savior, but listen, you can, there, there are no laws here. His grace is unlimited. He is going to bless whatever you do. And then there was the counter to that kind of movement back in the day, which was the holiness movement. And that's where we got the holiness code, right? And we had all of those laws that started to, or rules, I should say, that started to come in. This kind of was very heavy in the, in the uh, fundamentalist movement and, and the separationists, they were called the, uh, in, that, in that kind of time period. And, and so we had some of those rules that came up out of that. Anybody know some of those rules? Anybody? Maybe I, I hope I'm not bringing back, you back to your childhood here this morning. But right, like one of them was no movies, right? Absolutely no movies, you don't, especially you don't go to the movie theaters. There's just too much there. And you especially don't see rated R movies, right? That's a big no-no, unless it's The Passion of the Christ, which kind of throws a wrench in things. That was rated R. and that. So what do you do about that, right? But anyway, so there was no movies. Any other ones that you guys can think of? Playing cards, that's a good one, right? We don't play cards because that involves luck. And that's a Greek god. And no, no playing cards, that is a... That is a big one. How about no secular music, right? What constitutes secular music anyway, right? I guess it has to have Jesus in it or something like that, right? But I listen to country music from time to time, and that mentions Jesus and whiskey. So I don't know what you do with that, right? What do you do? That's kind of an odd one there. How about no dancing? So you got no, no dancing. Can't, can't be doing that. Anybody grow up with this one, no meat on Friday? No meat on Fridays. If you're Catholic like I was, right, at some point, you can't do meat on Fridays. No dancing, no drums. Anybody grow up with that one? Because that comes from tribes, you know, and, and that's pagan. That's a big no-no. Now, if you're eating meat on Fridays, dancing with drums, wow, you're in some trouble there. That's one-way ticket to you know where. So you also have, uh, you know, no meat on Fridays. I always wonder, why don't we have no vegetable Monday? You know, if we have no meat on Friday, why, why can't we do that, you know? But we have all of these rules that we came up with in order to make sure we don't abuse grace, right? To make sure we don't, we don't go the wrong way there. And it was a counter movement to the antinomianism movement. And I got to be honest with you, it really isn't about no rules or more rules but more relationship. And that is something I believe we see here from John chapter 8. I love what Chuck Swindell said. He said, all of those who are not qualified to condemn will condemn. Stay away from those people. The one who is qualified to condemn will not condemn you. Stay close to him. And that's what this is about. I'm going to have the worship team come up at this time as we close down our service. 
We see the woman was standing alone with Jesus. A relationship had begun. Jesus first showed compassion. That's the first C we see. Listen, we got to understand that as Christians. There's a saying, ballers are going to ball, golfers are going to golf, fishers are going to fish, and sinners are going to sin. We shouldn't be surprised when we see it. And for Jesus, he wasn't at all surprised. And he extended this woman compassion. But we also see that Jesus was not condemning. He was not a critic. He said, I have not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. And the third C we see is that Jesus was also not compromising. As he told this woman, go and sin no more. You see, when you meet Jesus, something changes in you to where you want to leave that life of sin behind. So I don't know where you are today, but you don't have to feel trapped by circumstances that other people have placed you in. You don't have to feel hopeless. And not only that, but we can be the sources of encouragement to those around us. Even, I believe, when things are seemingly hopeless. We can help others and lead them to God who can bring them a third option. Next time, I believe, when you feel like things seem possible, choose to paint the problem in the colors of grace and justice instead of black and white despair. Let us all stand at this time as we close down in prayer. Father, I thank you for this time in your word. We thank you for what you've shown us in this story. We see a woman who is in great need. We see a woman who is being used. And we see your wisdom and grace on display. God, for those of us who feel trapped today from our own circumstances, would you show us that hidden option? God, would you, would you open our eyes to who you are? Father, I pray more than anything that your people would invest more in a relationship with you because when that happens, everything changes. May we draw closer to you, Jesus. May we stop neglecting our time with you. God, we are so busy. We are so just filled with things in our schedule. Many of them good. Many of them great. But nothing can replace the greatest good, which is investing and, and, and spending time with you. And so I pray, Lord, that we would stay close to you. For those of us who have had a critical spirit, for those of us who have found ourselves only trying to find what is wrong with things, God, help us to find your grace, to move in you. God, I pray lastly, for anybody in here or watching online that has never really encountered you, they have never really placed their faith, their trust in your son, Jesus. Maybe they grew up in the church knowing all of the rules and all of the laws and all of that. But they've never really come to know you. They've never truly experienced joy and the grace that sets us free. Maybe there are those listening online or here today, Lord, that haven't grown up in the church, but their life is a wreck. They're, they're in a mess of a situation. God, would they find themselves standing alone, with you today, hearing those words, I don't condemn you, I'm not disappointed, I just want you to be free, I'm here to make it better, and may we, Lord, leave that life of sin behind. Thank you for what you've done for us and providing that third option, that option that came when you spread your hands out and allowed yourself to be nailed to a Roman cross. And how just three days later, 
you would be raised by the power of God to bring redemption and restoration to your people. We love you. We thank you for that. Without it, we would be nothing. We would have nothing. We would be presented with just two basic options, both of which would not be helpful. So we worship you today, thanking you for that God. And we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. God is good, isn't he? God is good, isn't he? Are we out there this morning, church? What's, don't, don't leave me up here hanging. Come on now. God is good, isn't he? Yeah. Amen. He is good. Thank God. Thank God for Jesus. Well, it's good for you to be here this morning. I, I do thank you for being here. Listen, if you need prayer, we want to be praying for you. I'm going to be up front here. If you want to respond to the message here this morning, don't let that go away. Don't let that conviction just seemingly leave your mind here this morning. I believe that's from God. If if you're here this morning and you're feeling heavy on your heart. And if you're watching online, we'd love to connect with you as well. Just please email our office at hopefromacomb.com. We'd love to be there for you. Or you can fill out the connection card that's attached to your bulletin if you'd want prayer that way as well. You can just fill that out and place it in one of the black boxes. Otherwise, I'd love again to pray for you here after the service. We do have Sunday school happening after service in about 15 to 20 minutes. So we'd love for you all to stick out, stay out for that. But other than that, I hope you have a blessed week. We'll see you all later. God bless everyone. Oh, thank you.